Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of the Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. I'm a psychiatrist. I study the mind and brain in its physical and cultural contexts. Meaningful coincidences like synchronicity and serendipity provide clues to how our minds and our brains connect deeply to our bodies, other people, nature, and our environment. Meaningful coincidences occur in all aspects of life. You need to just expect them. And you can pre-order my new book, Meaningful Coincidences, due out in September in the URLs that will appear below in the beginning of the text about this, this show from Inner Traditions and Simon and & Schuster. Well, I moved to Charlottesville in 2009 to establish a private practice and be associated with the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia, which is the only parapsychology research group in the United States that is part of a major university. I'd given a talk there, which was well received. Perhaps here was a group that could help me to develop my ideas about meaningful coincidences. And sure enough, it was. I, I, needed, I needed a referral once I got there to like establish my private practice. And our guest today pointed to a psychologist friend of his named Dave Waters. And I, I had a nice placement through, through Bruce's recommendation. I soon needed editorial help to write my first coincidence book. And into one meeting where I was presenting about meaningful coincidences walked Patrick Weege, who was returning to Charlottesville after working for major New York City publishing companies and magazines, and then has developed his own publication company here in Charlottesville. He invited me to write an article for a newsletter he was editing. Patrick has become a very, very good friend and an excellent editor. As usual, sometimes the need and its fulfillment come together like a hand in a glove, and that certainly happened with Patrick. Our guest today, Bruce Grayson, was the director of the Division of Perceptual Studies, affectionately known as DOPS, when I began writing my first book, Connecting with Coincidences. So many thanks to Bruce for connecting me with Dave Waters, and many thanks to Bruce for having the context in which to make the, make the connection with Patrick. Bruce Grayson is the Chester Carlson Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences and Director Emeritus now of the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia. He co-founded the International Association for Near-Death Studies and for 26 years edited the Journal of Near-Death Studies and has published extensively on near-death experiences. He is co-editor of the Handbook of Near-Death Experiences and author of the recent very, very popular book, After a Doc, it's called After. After, you know, like what happens after, <laughs> but then it's not after, <laughs> gives you a hint about after. <laughs> after a doctor explores what near-death experiences reveal about life and beyond. Bruce Grayson, welcome to Connecting with Coincidences. Well, thank you so much, Bernie. I'm delighted to be talking with you today. Thank you, Bruce. It's great to see you. It's been a little while. Yeah. Uh, it's been a little while. And you look wonderful. I mean, it's- Thank it's, you. It's, it's doing, something's doing right by you. So that's, that, <laughs> that, that's, a, good, that's a good thing. And it, it's nice to, nice to see you. So uh, one of the things as we talked about a little earlier is what to me was a major uh, meaningful coincidence for you 
when you were a faculty member and a certain Raymond Moody was a resident uh, in the ER uh, where you were supervising him. So uh, that was a life changer, uh, I think, for you. Uh, and uh, why don't you tell us some of the details about how you and Raymond Moody got together and what happened as a result? Yeah, let me give you a little background first. Um, I was raised in a, in a scientific household. My father was a chemist and it was a very materialistic upbringing. We didn't have any spiritual or religious background at, at all in our family. Um, so I was raised with that mindset that the physical world is all there is. When you die, that's the end of it. And that's, that's, that's just the way life is, that's fine. So I went through college and medical school with that mindset. And then when I started my psychiatric training at the University of Virginia, I started being confronted by patients who would talk about leaving their bodies when they were near death, usually as a result of suicide attempt, those are the people I saw, and then seeing things that others could corroborate while they were out of their bodies and their bodies were ostensibly unconscious. And this didn't make any sense to me as a materialist. You know, as far as I could tell, you are your body, how can you leave it? Um, so I just, you know, filed these away as, you know, psychotic ramblings or something I couldn't explain, I get to eventually. And then several years later in 1975, when I graduated from my psychiatric training, I took a job at the University of Virginia, uh, actually running the psychiatric emergency service. And one of my first interns who was working under me at that time was this young guy called Raymond Moody. He's actually, he's older than I was, uh, but he was starting his medical school at that point. So he had written a book uh, several months earlier called Life After Life, in which he gave us the name near-death experience and described what they were. I knew he had written a book, but I didn't know what it was about. It was just a small, it was published by uh, Mockingbird Press in St. Simons Island, Georgia, um, by his brother, by his brother-in-law, and you know, nobody ever heard of this thing. So one day when we were sitting in the emergency room, just you know, shooting the bull was a quiet time, I asked him about his book. And he started telling me about it. And I was dumbfounded. This is what I was hearing from my patients. And here he had hundreds of stories from people all over the world who were not patients, who were normal, everyday people. And I thought, this is, this is unbelievable. We need to look at this. You know, we're scientists. We're supposed to go towards the unknown and try to understand what's going on. Uh, shortly after that, within weeks, I think, someone at Bantam Press in New York read a copy of his book and was fascinated by it. They bought the rights to it and republished it in, in Bantam. And it sold, I think, uh, 3 million copies the first year. It was just a, a blockbuster. Uh, so Raymond was getting hundreds and hundreds of letters every week from people. And he came to me and said, look, I'm an intern. I can't deal with this stuff. At the time, I was working with Ian Stevenson, who had started the Division of Perceptual Studies, DOPS. Oh, so you'd already started in the crazy direction. Huh? <laughs> yeah, ah. right, right. How, I was did that, the, how, did you, how, how did you, from the scientific background, decide to start working with Ian? Well, as I said, my father was a scientist, and he trained me how to do science. And part of that was knowing that if you study things we know a lot about already, you can push back the boundaries a little bit. If you study things that we can't understand at all, that's where you make the breakthroughs. So I went to study things that we couldn't understand at all. Things like telepathy, clairvoyance. Uh, Ian liked to study little children, age two, three, four, who remembered past lives. And we had no mechanistic explanation for these things. So I figured I'm gonna study these and try to figure it out, thinking that there's gotta be some brain mechanism explaining all this. Now I was still materialist, but I wanted to study these unknowns. So actually in medical school, I was in New York, in, in Syracuse, New York. I took a month off and came down to Charlottesville to study with Ian for a month and do some work on his cases of little children. So when I came to apply for my psychiatric training, I applied to the University of Virginia, got in there and started working with him maybe a half a day a week when I could spare the time. So I knew Ian and when Raymond came to me with these boxes and boxes of, of letters. I said, we gotta take these to Ian and see what he thinks of them. So I started reading these letters and every one was starting out something like, you mean, I'm not the only person this happened to? Because nobody heard about these things. 
So Ian and I started writing to these people and saying, you know, tell us about your experience. And we started collecting cases. You can't learn a lot from one individual case. But if you collect hundreds and eventually thousands of cases, you can see patterns in there that can be corroborated across religions, across cultures. Uh, and now we know from doing more research across centuries. Um, we have cases going back to ancient Greece and Rome that sound like the cases we have today. I'm, I'm trying so, to get the synchronicity, a meaningful coincidence business oh, to that place to okay. collect enough stories to start seeing the patterns in them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so, so Raymond was there with all these cases coming into him. And I was there as a young faculty member looking for something to study. And I have my interest in unusual things. So I said, great, let me look at these cases. And Raymond, who didn't have time to look at them, not only was he a busy intern, but he also wasn't a scientist. He was a storyteller. So he, ah. wasn't, he didn't want to do research on it. He ah. wanted to tell the stories. Tell stories. Raymond quickly got other people writing to him from all over the country, psychologists, clinicians, physicians, who wanted to study this. People like Kenneth Ring at the University of Connecticut, um, Beverly Belk, who was in South Carolina, people all over, all over the country, Michael Sabom from, from Atlanta. So he said, we need to, to get these people together. So we had a conference one weekend to the University of Virginia, and we brought a dozen of these people together and talked about what to do with this, you know, because we were all at different institutions with, with no support, really. I was fortunate to have Ian Stevenson. Other people were not. So we decided we needed to get together and form some organization that could support each other, maybe develop consistent protocols for studying these things. And out of that came what's now the International Association for Near-Death Studies. It was incorporated in 1979, and it's been going strong ever since. Uh, we were kind of hoping that Raymond would run this organization. <laughs> he wanted no part of it. He's not an organization guy. He's not a joiner. He said, you do it. You can call me honorary president if you want, but I'm not going to be involved in anything. So Ken Ring was the president. I was the vice president. Mike Sabom, secretary, and, and John Odette was the treasurer. And we started the organization. After a few years, it became obvious to us that although we needed support, there was a greater need for the experiencers to have support. And over the years, it's become more and more an organization to support the near-death experiencers and to provide valid information for everybody and less and less to serve the needs of the researchers. Uh, an interesting sideline about this is that Ken Ring, who was in the, at the University of Connecticut, thought we should start our academic journal, a scholarly journal to publish this material because it was hard to get this stuff into mainstream medical journals. This is bizarre stuff. I argued vehemently against that. I thought this is a terrible idea. If you start your own journal, no one else is going to read it. Yes, it's hard well, to get that's, into that's too bad, Bruce. <laughs> well, it's <Look> worse. <laughs> I said, no, we need to force ourselves to publish in the mainstream journals, make it good enough to publish there. He won the he won the argument, started the journal, and a few months later. Yeah, that's what, I mean. that's what I mean. He took a sabbatical. <laughs> what away for a year said, would you take it over for a year while I'm gone? Yeah, just said, a year. <laughs> okay. Just a year. <laughs> he came back and said, I don't think I want to do that again. It's yours. <laughs> so it took me 27 years to find someone to take over, take over for me. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. So there was, there was a lot of coincidence there. There was Raymond being at the University of Virginia at the same time I was his book coming out just when I was starting my career and the fact that I was seeing near-death experiences before this, but not knowing what they were and then reading his book to put it all together for me. Yeah. And you having the curiosity to recognize you got to stretch the boundaries, still, right. still thinking like a scientist, but trying to say, here's a new territory that we can apply science thinking to. Right. And in fact, if Ian Stevenson hadn't been at the University of Virginia with this organization, the Division of Perceptual Studies, I wouldn't have had the infrastructure to be able to do this research. Yeah. Yeah. But you went from Syracuse to visit him for a month. So yes. you, you, you were helping make this happen for reasons that you didn't quite understand. 
Right. But, but you were curious and right. you were drawn to it. I mean, well, it's always easy, as Freud said, to look back in retrospect to see yes. how yes. this stuff happens. But I'm still impressed with there's Bruce Grayson in Syracuse, a medical student. He, he goes to study with Ian Stevenson of Virginia because he's doing something that what is he interested in? And, and that's it's kind of pressing maybe to pushing the boundaries of science and that's maybe what you have in mind that somewhere in you was to investigate new territories right and additional additionally you know i wanted to get out of the snow of syracuse for a month in the winter and go to charlottesville yeah hey, I, I like that i mean we gotta <laughs> add that stuff <laughs> we gotta add that stuff well there it's a it's a nice sequence to look back at but there is a what I call uh, human GPS, uh, getting someplace you need to be without knowing quite how you got there. Yeah, yeah. That, that there was a, and this is like Rex Stanford kind of thinking, uh, PMIR, Psi Mediated yeah. Instrumental Responses, that if this was all drawn somehow, it looks like it could be. I mean, you can make up those stories, but one story doesn't make the whole story. Uh, but I've collected enough stories where people seem to follow a path without knowing quite how they're getting there. And then something happens. Yeah. For me, it was no. my dog getting lost and I got lost and we found each other. Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, that was the simple version of this whole thing. Uh, right. Well, it, when, when I started reading these, these letters from Raymond and took them to Ian, I asked Ian, you know, do you know about near-death experiences? He didn't know what I was talking about. But when he started realizing what they were, he had lots of these in his files that he'd been collecting during the 1960s before Raymond published his book. But they, of course, weren't called near-death experiences. But people had been sending him accounts of what he called out-of-body experiences or deathbed visions or you know, apparitions. But they were basically near-death experiences, unusual things people had as they were approaching death that fit the, the pattern of what Raymond called near-death experiences. So you were able to confirm with for Ian what he had and didn't know he had. Right. And we were able to compare those cases that he had collected in the 1960s with cases we collected decades later after everyone knew what Raymond Moody's NDE was like and to see that, in fact, there was no difference. What we were collecting before Raymond told us what to look for is the same thing we're, feel, we're finding now. And the patterns uh, tend to be pretty similar, not always the same, obviously, but there are some basic patterns to near-death right. experiences that you could see. I can't, in coincidences, there are no like basics like that because uh, there's a lot mm. of different forms. Yeah. It yeah. makes it harder to do, but how did you systematically come up with seeing those repeated patterns? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it was a challenge because most people who have a near-death experience, when you say to them, tell me about what happened to you, they say, well, I can't, you can't put it into words. There are, there are any, there's no language to describe this. So we say, great, tell me about it, you know? So we're sort of forcing them to use metaphors to describe what happened to them. And the metaphors really come from your cultural or religious background. So for example, people all over the world We'll talk about encountering a warm, loving being of light. And if you happen to be a Christian in the US, you may say, this was God or this was Christ. Whereas if you're a Hindu or a Buddhist, you weren't going to use that term, but you describe the same basic phenomenon. And in fact, many people I've interviewed here in the US will say, I'm going to call this light God, so you know what I'm talking about. But this is not the God I was taught about in church, it's much bigger than that. And likewise, many people around the world will talk about, in order to get from this physical realm to the other world where the NDE takes place, they went through a long, dark, enclosed place. And many Westerners will say, I went through a tunnel. Well, if you talk to people who live in third world countries, they don't use the word tunnel. They may say, I went into a well or into a cave, uh, or to the, the, the deep throat of a huge flower. But they're talking about the same thing. In fact, I interviewed one truck driver who said, and then I got sucked into this long tailpipe. So it is a dark space that's long that you get from here to the other world. <laughs> so we have you know, basic phenomena that recur across cultures. 
we have a sense of leaving the physical body, feeling tremendous peace and well being, having a review of your entire life, often from a third person perspective as well, not only through your own eyes, but through the eyes of other people involved in the scenes. There's an encounter usually with some benign loving deities or entities that most people interpret as deities, often encounters with what they interpret as deceased loved ones. And at some point, reaching a decision to come back to life or reaching a barrier they can't cross and they're told to come back. And as a psychiatrist, I gotta say that the most important part of it to me is not the experience itself, but the way it affects people's lives. They have drastically changed attitudes, values, beliefs, and behavior after the NDE. Like what kind of changes? Well, the most common thing people say is that I am no longer afraid of dying. I'm not afraid of death. I've been there. It's not something to be afraid of. That doesn't mean they're suicidal. Um, actually, I was worried about that when I first started hearing this. If you talk about this, that's going to push people over the edge. Well, I then did a study interviewing people who made a suicide attempt and were admitted to the hospital. And I compared those who had a near-death experience as a result of that suicide attempt and those who didn't. And the ones who had a near-death experience were much less suicidal afterwards than those who didn't have an NDE. And when I asked them why that was, they said, well, now, even though I'm not afraid of dying, I see the meaning and purpose into everything that happens here. And I can see that the problems I have are not something to run away from, but something I'm supposed to learn from and grow from. And they see life as being much more meaningful and joyful now and makes them less suicidal. That idea that we have, we're here to learn that uh, I refer to it as Earth University. Yeah, yeah. Is so vital. I, I mean, I thought maybe because I'm an academic or a recovering academic, I should say, <laughs> uh, is like uh, this learning thing seems to be a better placement for greed. Yeah. That it drives us to know more and experience more rather than yeah. accumulate um, material things. That scene, and I'm, I, I'm glad to keep hearing that from other perspectives that yeah, we're here yeah. to learn. We're here to learn about ourselves and the world we're in and the people we're with. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that occurs to me is if this other realm, which is presumably an afterlife, although who knows what, what it is, if that's so much better than this life, why did we come here in the first place to be born? Hey, that's the question. <laughs> And well, I asked near-death experiencers that. And they do say basically what you just said, the, the university here, you know, this is, we come here because there are things you can learn in the physical body that you can't learn over there. You need the conflict and the dissension here to be able to learn how to love in this context, which you can't do in the other realm. Got to get used to polarities. Yeah. You've got to get yeah. used to polarities. And you've got to see, yeah, they're polar, but they're also part of the same thing, too. Yes, exactly. So how do you do both and, which is so hard for human beings? Yeah, yeah. That's a, I, that seems to me a big challenge. And you're saying that that's part of the reason they come back. Yeah. What is, what, how is all this? I, you you visited the Dalai Lama as part of your uh, work yeah. in this, and how has this affected Dr. Bruce Grayson, MD, psychiatrist's view of death? Well, I'm 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 not certainly not afraid of death, but I can't say that I was before either. Um, you know, when I started out, I thought, okay, death is just nothingness. What's to be afraid of there? You know, you're not you're not aware to be afraid of anything, so you just stop existing. Great. So that, that, I wasn't feeling negative about death beforehand, but now I've heard so many accounts I can't explain of people having corroboratable things happen to them after they seem to have passed over that I believe that there is something after death. I can't get away from being a scientist, so I say I'm not sure. <laughs> I could be misinterpreting the data. It could be more data coming in 20 years from now that'll contradict this. But right now it looks as if there is something after death. As for what it is, I have no idea because what people tell me are metaphors for what happens. So I don't believe in the literal aspects of what they say. 
Uh, for example, when they say, you know, I met my mother, well, how did you know it was your mother? Sometimes they say, well, it just looked just like her, but sometimes they say, I sensed her essence. It was just another ball of light, but I sensed that was my, it felt like my mother. So, there's, yeah, there's, there's still a lot of projection going on out there. Yeah. There too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're psychiatrists. We always think about these alternative <laughs> way of explaining these things. But, you know, I, I think there is something there and something that's not to be afraid of. So uh, a part of me is looking forward to seeing what happens after death. And if nothing happens, I won't know to be disappointed. Now, one of the things that Ian tried to have happen is that he would he would pass over and then come back and give the combination to the locks. Yeah. That hasn't happened as far as I it know. It is not. It is not. <laughs> Yeah. Well, what do you do with that one? Oh, we just wait, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a little while. It's been yeah. a little while. I, I had a patient with the, who just wanted to die because it was so much better out there. Uh, yeah. And yeah. she knew that from psychedelic experiences and other things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and she made a big suicide attempt uh, shortly after I started seeing her. You know, a lot of blood in her bedroom. Parents had to re repaint the place she's about 21 and she recovered so she said i guess i gotta stick around here <laughs> she had some great stories of running around with a lot of friendly spirits and people she mm -hmm. knew and good synchronicities happening between and among and uh after a couple of years she says uh dr Bateman, i have some good news for you <laughs> i don't need you anymore <laughs> And I, I missed her. I really liked her. She was, she was a spiritual being in them as she got yeah. more adapted to this reality. And she did. And that was it. She was gone. I remember it quite clearly. Uh, she decided to stick around. And I never really understood why. But uh, she was one of those who did experience, not with a near death, but some other ways, yeah, yeah. to want to be out there. Uh, yeah. And I think there'll probably be others. It's interesting she said that she has good news for you, not good news for her. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know if she was talking about good news just for me. I think she might have been saying <laughs> it about her. I, that I couldn't tell. I appreciate the projection, but yeah. <laughs> I think it was her because I was the one who was bereft. <laughs> I, I like, she was really just a wonderful, wonderful person yeah. to, to be able to relate to. Now, that's that's a series of coincidences and information that we just ran through, which I like to have our audience uh, hear, not just because it's so personal and real with you, but there's a lot of these sequences that we walk into. And it's very easy to look back, as we said, but still decisions you made for reasons that weren't evident to you. I got to get yeah. out of the Syracuse uh, snow, um, but why there? Um, yeah it's it's your curiosity so uh, i like to look when i look at coincidences for a lot of things happening uh in the context but this responsibility of the individual is a much more key part to it than a lot of people yeah. will say yeah yeah here you made decisions in a context and it's like with psychotherapy they don't want to like take responsibility for what happened to them exactly so what I'm trying to do is say, well, what part did you play in this? It wasn't the whole thing. Right. And you've made it nice and very clear that, yeah, you did decisions that made this all happen for you so that you had a wonderful book, um, uh, people all over the world getting to know you. You're not a big ego, ego guy. I know that. Uh, it's, you're not doing this for the ego. You're doing it because you're a scientist and your heart is in it and you're exploring it. But you have this problem, Bruce. You want to help people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've got this problem. It's in you. And, and you have helped thousands and thousands of people yeah. with doing this. So um, you everyone, including me, appreciates what you had to do with all the hard parts of this um, yeah. to get this out there. So, that's yeah. you know, you mentioned before, the name of my book is After, kind of referring to what happens after death. And that was what the person who suggested that title 
had in mind, what happens after you die. But as I was writing it, it became obvious to me, it's really about what happens to you in this life after you've had an NDE. Yeah. And, and as I was finishing the book, it also occurred to me, it's also what happens to you, the reader, if you've read the book. Does it change you? What That's, do you do with this information? Yeah. Yeah. At, at the, and in a smaller way, coincidence is the same idea. What happens afterwards? What do you do with yeah. them? Yeah. What yeah. do you do with them? And some people yeah. don't do anything. Right. Well, right. So I things, had this, I had this strange experience. So what? You know, what do I do with it? Exactly. And what you've done is allow people to say there's a lot of other strange experience, people who have the same kind of experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm doing that with coincidences or getting people together. It's just the beginning where you were years ago of being able to like get yeah. people to say, hey, are you too? I mean, have this like it's like and getting people who've been studying them a lot, talking with each other and they don't feel so much alone anymore. Yeah, yeah. That's, and we got, we're getting an, uh, not a nonprofit or getting started right now. So it's right. It's that kind of organization that you did that you're the forerunner for. And I'm not going to be around long enough to see it the way you have. Because, <laughs> you know, I was doing psychotherapy stuff and yeah. being chairman for all those years. And I didn't get to this stuff I wouldn't have anyway, because uh, I had to find it myself. But it's, it's a similar process that what you've gone through, uh, I've started. Well, let's, let's, let's start with uh, a simple uh, coincidence that involved uh, you and me. And then I want to come back to some of the near death ones that we that you proposed to me. But why don't you tell why don't you tell our audience about the Bruce Grayson synchronicity series? Yeah, this was a synchronicity about synchronicities. Um, it was about 15 years ago uh, when you contacted me um, kind of out of the blue, as far as I was concerned, I didn't know who you were. Um, and you were at the time planning your retirement from being chair at University of Missouri. And you were thinking about moving to Charlottesville for your retirement. So you contacted me. And among other things, you sent me a chapter you had written for the, um, the Oxford series on integrative medicine that dealt with coincidences and how they can be used therapeutically. And I, I was Great material, I loved it. Within a few weeks of that, I got an email again out of the blue from a psychologist in Arizona who I didn't know, uh, Robert Perry, who sent me a chapter of his book that was entirely on coincidences and their therapeutic uses. I thought, well, this is something. Two people I didn't know coming to me out of the blue to talk about how you can use coincidences therapeutically. A few weeks after that, I was at a conference in San Francisco and I met an old friend, Gary Schwartz, who I haven't seen in years. And we were talking about, you know, what we're doing lately. And he said, well, I'm, I'm starting to write a book about coincidences and how to use them therapeutically. I thought, this is, this is too much. Three people who don't know each other, all contacting me to talk about their book on, on therapeutic uses of coincidence. So I said to Gary, well, you know, Bernie Beitman is, is coming to Charlottesville uh, on such and such date um, to look over the place and see where he wants to, to move here. And Gary said, I'm going to be in the Charlottesville the same date for a conference. So that was just a little too much. <laughs> What's going on here? Well, one of the fun things I get to ask is, uh, is since you were in the middle of it, uh, I get to say, what did this mean to you, Bruce Grayson, to be in the center of this thing? Yeah, well, that's, that's the, the real question. What does it mean? Um, you know, your first reaction is, boy, that's weird. Yeah, uh, that's right. But where do you go from there? You know? Yeah. And I didn't particularly have an interest in coincidences at the time. 
So why are these three people contacting me out of the blue to, to share their, their ideas about coincidence with me? And obviously I was a hub for something, but I'm not sure why. And um, today I'm still not sure, except this made me much more aware of coincidences and what role they play in people's lives and how people go about trying to make sense of them. Um, I, I like to think of it as a, a kind of a introduction for what I was doing to DOPS, to you. No. That's, that's, they're, they're, coincidences often involve two people or more. And so for me, it was like, oh, okay, this might be a good place for me to go. Mm -hmm. And so it made you think, well, maybe there is something here too. Yeah. And you had that yeah. happen. So it, it gave me an, an opening, a, a wider opening to again do what you had started to do, saying, you know, there's something weird going on here. I can think yeah. scientifically. Yeah. So can I make this into something that we can study in a scientific way? Right. And, and as you mentioned earlier, around the same time, Patrick Weege retired to Charlottesville, started his own publication, publishing company, and there you met him at our DOPS meetings. And I was giving a talk. Yes. And then met him. So you, you're, again, without, which is kind of stumbling along in the life you're doing, but we're a wonderful facilitator for yeah. my being able to find a good place to plant where I could talk with people and expand my understanding about parapsychological things because synchronicity yeah. is within the parapsychology business for the most part, not always. Yeah. And, yeah. Telephony, clairvoyance uh, uh, for Jung were part of synchronicity. Is more to it than that. Uh, yours, your things with Gary and me and Robert were were seriality ones. That yeah, yeah. Ca camera came up with. I mean, that's to me a form of meaningful coincidence that doesn't get paid attention to a lot, but they're there. So the, some of the questions uh, that uh, you, you raised, which I find fascinating, Bruce is uh is one of them was uh, are people who are aware of coincidences more likely to have near-death experiences when they come close to death yeah yeah tell us about that yeah well um a lot of near-death experiencers will talk about meaningful coincidences and uh it's hard to quantify this but they all act as if this is part of their connection to the to the spiritual world now to the divine um, you know, one, one person actually calls them uh, postcards from God. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so when you came out with your, your brilliant uh, weird coincidence survey, I decided I'm going to give this to near-death experiences, see if I can quantify if they're having a lot of these experiences or not. And I thought I'm going to ask them to fill out this questionnaire twice, once with regard to what they were like before they had their near-death experience. And then again, after the experience. And as it turned out, I, I gave this to 200 near-death experiencers. What they said before the NDE was that they generally had slightly less than your norm data had for the general population in terms of both the, the rate of coincidences and also the um, uh, interpersonal and agentic uh, subcategories of this. Uh, they also tended, you also had questions in the scale that were not part of those, uh, those factors, but they involved interpretation of the event. And the near-death experiences were a little bit lower than the general population in terms of tending to interpret these things as meaningful. However, after the near-death experience, it was totally different. They had far more coincidences of both the interpersonal and agentic type and were far more likely to interpret these as meaningful, uh, as having a, an important message from the universe, from the divine, whatever you want to call it. So what this means is that if, I, if this is right, um, having an awareness of meaningful coincidences does not make it more likely that you will have an NDE when you come close to death. But having an NDE makes you much more attuned to coincidences in your life and much more aware to, to see them and interpret them um, 
after the ND. Of course, whether you have more or just are more aware of them is something we can't answer. I have to qualify this because I didn't survey these people before they had their NDE. So I'm asking them to retrospectively look at what were you like before the NDE. So the fact that they reported fewer coincidences before that may have been retrospective fabrication. I mean, they may have not remembered things afterwards because as I said before, the near-death experience changes so much about your life, you're primed to think, oh, I'm very different now than I was before. So they may be artificially and inaccurately saying I had fewer of these before the NDE. Oh, that's a great, that's a great comment. I wondered about that too. Um, yeah. When I saw it. Uh, yeah. How can you remember? You can do it now. Uh, yeah. Right. 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 It's, it's still one of those. Go ahead. Well, the, the question then is, what is the connection? Why does having a near-death experience make you more likely to have an, a coincidence or be aware of them and interpret these things as not just, oh, that was weird, but as something meaningful. Um, and there are different ways of, of looking at this. You can just say that being exposed to this other reality, whether it's through an NDE or through psychedelic trips as your patient did, once you've opened the door to these anomalies, it doesn't ever close again. And then you, when you see things that are quote weird, like a coincidence, you pay attention to them the way you wouldn't have before. Yeah. Um, Ed Kelly and, and Michael Grosso talk about this in terms of the brain being a filter for our consciousness. In a normal everyday life, the brain filters out all this spiritual nonsense because the brain evolved as a physical organ to help us survive in the physical world. It helps us to do, find food and shelter and a mate and so forth. You don't need to deal with spirits in order to do that. So that gets ruled out. And the filter just lets in things that are relevant to the physical world. In a near-death experience or in a psychedelic trip, that filter is loosened and all this other stuff comes in. And once the filter is loosened, it never quite goes back to as tight as it was before. Hmm. It never goes back to as tight as it was before. I interviewed a, a woman who does psychedelic uh, treatment of uh, uh -huh. depression uh, in London. Um, and they find that the, the, the depressive symptoms get relieved yeah. quite regularly, but a lot of them get more, start getting depressed again once they go out into the world. Oh. Oh. And it's probably a little like a heroin addict getting treatment someplace and then going back into the same population that he was using. You go back to the same stressors and, yeah. Yeah. and expectations. So they developed a group to try to help them integrate. Now, one of the strange things is this woman is uh, who did a scale called with a WCS scale, the Watts Connection Survey. Her name was uh -huh. Watts. So uh, we made us have a little fun coincidence with that. So I thought maybe the psychedelics help people connect with each other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, through coincidences but coincidences were a medi mediating variable that helped them hmm. connect with others. <clears throat> That's interesting. She, she knows this happens to them. Her group who puts the, does the psychedelic um, therapies, the therapists involved have coincidence, synchronicity happening between them and among them. Hmm but they won't talk about them. <laughs> they won't talk about them. And here I'm saying that the synchronicities that happen after the psychedelic experience are there to help them continue to integrate. Yeah. yeah. How do I address anybody who has that kind of bias? Well, I uh, assume that they are not recognized because it's fearful. It's just they're afraid of it for some reason. And I think the trick is to make them feel more comfortable with it, that this is a normal hap thing that happens to everybody. It's not something that's a sign of mental illness or disturbance, psychological disturbance. It's a normal thing that you have happened to you that you can learn from. The, the therapists themselves are afraid to talk about it. And they think it's not scientific. Right. 
even when I send them papers <laughs> that say, yeah, we've done this. And look, I've done an encyclopedia article on it. It looks like something. It's, it's something that I imagine you've run into where sure. uh, the, nobody wants to hear what you're talking about. Right. If you can't measure blood levels, then it doesn't really exist. Yeah, it's got to be a brain problem. So yeah. it's a similar problem. Ed Kelly has been trying to face it for quite a long time, about yeah. a long, hard slug for him. Yeah. Uh, but he, I'm, I'm sympathetic with that because I, I started out that way. So I understand their thinking. And it's a very comforting way of thinking about things. It's challenging to think that there's an unknown world we can't really understand. That's scary for a lot of people. I understand that. Yeah, that's true of telepathy, among other things, too. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. So here we are knowing there's uh, something going on that's useful to humanity that people don't want to hear. And we call that denial in the therapy mm. business. Yeah. Um, and trying to work through it, you have by volume. <laughs> you worked it out with having a lot of stuff, people and papers and research. And there's still people who say it's got to be the brain not functioning for a while. Sure. It's not going to go away. Well, one, one, one more question uh, that you let me have to consider with you is what do coincidences and near-death experiences have in common, Bruce? Well, it, uh, again, this is hard to put into words, but I think what they have in common is that they both get us out of thinking that we are just these physical shells contained within the body. And it shows us that there are connections that may or may not be physical um, and that we're all kind of interconnected. And there are links here that we're not usually aware of. Um, it's like if you look at your, your fingers, they look like they're separate entities. But if you look at the whole hand, you see they're really all inter interconnected. But we usually don't see that. So you think, oh, these are, these are separate things. And one of the lessons you get from near-death experiences or psychedelic trips is that you get out of your body and find that you're fine there without the body and that you exist out there. So that when you come back in, you remember... Yeah, this isn't all there is to me. There's more to it. And coincidences, I think, tell you the same thing. That there's more going on here than just the physical realm that we know about. And you mentioned a key element uh, that we are all interconnected. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do here is call this mental atmosphere that we are all immersed in. Uh, the psychosphere mm -hmm. and I'm trying to develop a cartography of the psychosphere uh. <laughs> I just was rich interviewed I mean saw a guy Richard Grossinger who helped my book get into inter, inner traditions he's got a, a painting on his oh. wall that's a, an ayahuasca something or other and while we were talking in this zoom call yesterday he looks over at the painting and he says Hey, that's all about the interpersonal connections uh -huh. surrounding these people, not mm -hmm. just two people here, but it's all these other entities with which these minds are connected. So these guys had put together uh, a picture of how the psychosphere may be operating. And I, I, I like that photograph, but it's a dynamic thing. It keeps yeah. moving around. So when you say from your near-death experiences that every we're all interconnected. I, I sharpen that idea up for me, please. Well, there are certain things about the near-death experience that really drive this home to people. And one of them I alluded to earlier was having a life review in which you see things not through your eyes alone, but also through the eyes of other people. And that gives you the sense that we are all the same. We are all interconnected, that we're all made of the same stuff. and and what we call my consciousness is an illusion. It's really part of a greater consciousness that everyone else shares. Um, so there, it's not something that they were told in the NDE, but something they actually experienced. And I've known people who experienced the same thing with psychedelic drugs, with meditation, uh, with a variety of, of spiritual traditions from other cultures that lead them into this state where they're outside the physical body. And interacting with 
other beings, other entities that they assume beforehand were separate entities, but are really not. We're all part of the same thing. People uh, have told me that it's like a wave in the ocean. You know, a wave is a discrete thing for a short amount of time. And then it falls back into the ocean. It becomes part of the same thing of everything else. Well, I, I'm in between the, it's all <laughs> one thing. And the reality of this physical world. Yeah. And the idea that uh, some meaningful coincidences, including telepathy, as an example, or what I call simulpathy, experiencing the pain of another one, a loved one at a distance, yeah, that Ian yeah. wrote about in, in telepathic impressions. Yes, yes. That these are, these are in between the all one and my body separate, uh, uh, them demonstrating specific connections between the person, one, two people, and maybe, and maybe others. What do yeah. you think of that? Well, I think when we're here in the physical body, we feel very connected to it. So we feel like there's a connection between me and someone else, but we're not the same thing. But um, let's have this conversation in about 30 years and see what we think then, you know, when we're no longer in the body. And, uh... <laughs> well, as we get close to the end of this, one of my favorite questions that I've raised to myself, anyway, it adopts, is there's this all one consciousness thing that, uh, that Ed gets into a lot. Yeah. Ed Kelly is another DOPS member uh, for our audience to know. And there's this physical brain. But there's this mind in between the consciousness and the brain uh, somehow, at least that's the way I think about it. Yeah. So this mind seems to be able to go into, in the, into the greater consciousness, as you've described so well, but also has something to do with making the brain operate or making the brain respond in certain ways. So how does the mind fit in between consciousness and brain function? Yeah. Well, there are different ways of looking at this, but I conceive the mind as being a subset of that greater consciousness Yeah, that has sort of formed itself as a separate entity from the consciousness, maybe for a limited amount of time. It may be that eventually after death it mold, molds back melts back into the greater consciousness uh, i'm not sure that's the truth um there are some suggestions from various lines of research that there is a still still a mind functioning after death that we can still relate to certainly uh connections with deceased loved ones imply that there's still an intact mind out there after death that's not merged into the greater consciousness um some people, including Ed Kelly, have gotten to the point of saying the physical world, including the brain and the body, doesn't really exist. That all that exists is consciousness. And consciousness creates this virtual reality of a, of a physical world uh, for various purposes. Um, I can't go there yet. <laughs> uh, he tells me that I will eventually. <laughs> I feel too much... Uh, a part of this physical reality. Me too, me too. And, you know, I, I, I think there is another part of us that we somehow relate to. Uh, and this is not a new idea. Hippocrates said 2,000 years ago that the brain is the messenger or the interpreter of the mind. So clearly this is a sense that the mind needs the brain to make the body work. Yeah. Uh, but how it happens, I'm not sure. Well, that is a what I'm trying to ask about is how the mind helps the brain work and what, how do we imagine as scientists needing to have like uh, diagrams uh, and yeah. visuals like anatomy to be able to have some sense for there's mind helping the brain function. How does mind interface with brain? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And there have been different models for this over the centuries based on the current technology. Um, and now people often talk about the mind being the software and the brain being the hardware. And you need both of them to make the program work. Um, these are all metaphors. So you can't take them seriously as, as being literally what's, what's happening. But there's some idea that's been going on for centuries that the mind is a non-physical entity 
that's conscious and aware and has uh, impulses. Um, and then there's the physical body that requires the brain to sort of translate from this consciousness, this mind, to make the physical body work. Um, how it happens, I have no idea. Uh, this has been the real problem with this dualistic attitude that there's two different things and they, there's no way they can, they can relate. Uh, I think the answer must be to say that we're not asking the right question, that they're not two different entities, maybe they're different aspects of the same one, like two sides of a coin or two different ways of describing the same thing. I've, I've gotten to thinking of them both being uh, different and uh, the same uh, energy at different frequencies. Mm. And the way that you pass from mind to brain or brain to mind is, the, is like how ice can melt into water mm. or water freezes. You have to put energy into the system or take it out in order for that boundary to be crossed. Mm. Well, if you think about it in those terms, then you're saying that the, the, the ultimate uh, construction of, of brain and mind is the same stuff, but uh, transformed by some physical process. It's, it's transformed somehow by the physical process of uh, frequency of vibration. Right. So if it's a frequency of a vibration, it might be possible to measure the mind as well as the brain. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Hmm. That's nice. We'll leave that for the next generation to start out. That's, that's what we're doing, Bruce. We're laying yeah. down. We're laying down the laying down the legacies. Yeah. yeah. What what I'm doing now, among other things, um, but my major focus now is to is is um, the question about whether the collective human organism is committing suicide right now mm -hmm. uh, that I like to think of future generations. I love yeah. my grandchildren and see what they're up to. You do too, yeah. I know. And it's like this future that we are destroying our habitat right now is like by greed of material things and yeah. robbing mother earth continuously. And she's reacting against us. How are you thinking about that problem? Well, I think you're right that we are doing that. Uh, my hope and what keeps me going in this is that we're not going to die. We're going to have a near death experience. And by going through that, our consciousness will be transformed and we'll stop doing these crazy things, destroying ourselves. Yeah. And it may be that we, maybe the whole planet will have a near death event and be transformed by it and come out better for it. Ah, and that's the metaphor, you know, better than, <laughs> than anybody practically. And I'm using the, my little bicycle of coincidences, hoping we don't get to the alcoholic having the hit yeah. bottom in order to, to open his mind up to something better that he needs to do, like stop yeah. drinking. Uh, I'm hoping to use the incremental thing of synchronicity to say, we got to organize ourselves and try to do the right thing. But yeah. I, <laughs> I've heard this. You know, Mike, Michael Grosso's and the apocalypse now. I think revelations, yeah. I think revelations is in the back of a lot of people's minds. The la final book of the uh, yeah. Christian Bible, where it's all going to blow up and only the good people will be saved. I don't know about that, but <laughs> that, that it, there's a kind of implicit uh, Thanatos that Freud took a long time to get yeah. to in each of us and in the human organism. And it may be that, that you, you've given me the, the answer I'd rather not have, uh, <laughs> but shoot the thing, but maybe it won't die. And then it come back in some other form yeah. and uh, more aware of itself. Uh, I've heard that. I've heard that too often get thrown against the wall and then maybe yeah. you change your mind. It's another way of yeah. saying it, but yeah. Yeah, that's a perfect answer from, uh, I think one of the world's leading experts on near death experience to my question. Um, as we end Bruce, uh, I like to ask people to tell us something personal about yourself, something that you might, uh, 
not say in a regular interview because this is kind of like uh, cognitive and uh, idea fo focus, but just to get to know people, let's get no, have people get to know you a little better. Tell us a little about Bruce Grayson. Well, when I think about how this work has changed me, yeah, um, you know, I'm not a believer in, in anything. <laughs> and I think it's probably the sun's going to come up tomorrow, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, so I can't say I believe this or that about death or about what happens after death. But what has changed is my feelings, my attitudes about these things. When I started doing this research 50 years ago, I was a materialistic scientist. We're going to have all the answers. And it's very important to have the answers. And it was a little scary not to have them. And now I've seen so many things that not only don't have answers, but um, maybe aren't even answerable questions that I'm very comfortable now not having the answers. I feel, I can't prove it, but I feel that the universe is a benign place and that's okay to trust it and not trying to control it and have all the answers. And that's changed my life in a lot of ways. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you very much, Bruce Grayson. Uh, this is a wonderful conversation uh, to have with you. Uh, I'm glad you were able to make the time yeah. for it. And I really like you. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that I got to know you even better in this way. So thank you for, for being on my show. Well, thank you for this great opportunity, Bernie. I love talking to you. This psychosphere is a mental atmosphere. Consciousness